Welcome to the 2023 annual 3MT uh, contest for the College of Humanities, 3MT's three minute thesis. I'm Scott Miller, Dean of the College, and uh, we're really grateful to have you all here both to witness and to participate in this annual tradition in the College. Uh, I'd first like to explain the history of the three minute thesis idea began in the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008. And now the program is spread around the world. I don't know if it's in every country, but a lot of countries do this. Uh, we've been doing it in the College of Humanities for a number of, number of years, and it ha there's a local competition within the departments, and then the winners from that local competition will compete in the college comp competition today, and the, winners from the, the, winner from the top winner from the college competition will compete in the university-wide competition. Uh, well, they compete for cash prizes against winners from other colleges on campus. Our humanities competition wouldn't be possible without the help of our three judges. So, would all the judges stand? One is already standing, but would you stand, please? Let me introduce you to the, our judges today are Kevin Blankenship, Assistant Professor in Department of Asian Near Eastern Languages, Lisa Morgan Johnson, Assistant Professor in Linguistics Department, and Rob McFarland, a professor in the German and Russian Department. Please join me in thanking our judges. We're also very grateful to the college office staff for the help they've given us in putting this all together, including the timer in back and the camera and everything else. So thank you, and let's show them our thanks. I'll explain the official rules for the 3MT. A single static PowerPoint slide is permitted. No slide transitions are permitted. Animations or movement of any descriptions are also uh, not allowed. This uh, the slide is to be presented from the beginning of the, of the oration, and so you get one slide, it doesn't move, it doesn't do anything fancy. We do have a laser pointer. We may be really violating the rules dramatically here, but we've decided to unilaterally apply them. If any of you want to use the laser pointer, it's here. We'll consider that not an animation, how's that? Uh, no additional electronic media, i.e. soundtrack and video files are permitted, no additional props. No costumes, musical instruments, laboratory equipment, etc. are permitted. No uh, pre presentations are limited to a maximum of three minutes and competitors exceeding three minutes are disqualified. So watch the clock. That will tell you how much time you have left. Uh, presentations are to be spoken word, no poems, raps, or songs. Presentations are to commence from the stage and are considered to have commenced when a presenter starts the presentation through either movement or speech. So if you scratch your nose, the clock starts. Um, the decision of the adjudicating panel is final. Now, we offer in the college the following prizes for our top competitors. First prize gets $1,000, second prize $750, third prize $500. This is not a low budget affair. We will proceed in order listed in the program with an approximately two minute pause in between presentations while the judges input their scoring. Each particip participant's slide will be displayed on the screen indicating their turn and their time will begin as soon as they start speaking, as I mentioned, or moving. Participants, please pay attention to the program order and come to the side of the stage over here on my left so they'll be ready to enter the stage promptly. At the conclusion of the last presentation, we'll immediately count the judges' scores and winners will be announced. Um, we encourage you to stay for the entire event so that you can congratulate our, participa our participants. So will the first two presenters make your way to the stage on my left? That would be Megan Johnson and Brianna Jones. So Megan, come on up here. We'll first hear from Megan Johnson representing English. Her presentation is entitled The Politics of Education in Narnia. Recent scholarship has taken an interest in C.S. Lewis's political views and how they are manifested in his fiction. However, few have thoroughly analyzed the specific political implications of his children's series, The Chronicles of Narnia. Part of this may be because Lewis himself insisted that his fiction was nonpartisan, a claim that may have been motivated by his desire to appeal to all Christian audiences. This thesis contributes to the growing discourse on political commentary in Lewis's fiction by exploring the question, did the Chronicles of Narnia respond to education reform? 
My research has shown that yes, there are links between education reform during the 1940s and 1950s England and the Chronicles of Narnia. For example, the, in The Abolition of Man, C.S. Lewis refers to a textbook embodying the modern education movement as the Green Book. The Memorandum of the Education Act, 1944, which expanded government influence in education, is also referred to as the Green Book. Commentary is also implicit in the silver chair, silver chair when Lu Jill Pohl and Eustace Scrub find Prince Relian under the control of the Green Witch. When they first encounter Prince Relian, he is in armor. He's like a shell. And their companion, Puddle Glum, questions if it really is a person underneath this armor. Um, this is a reference to the inter innervated individuals that are a result of modern education that C.S. Lewis refers to as men without chess um, in the abolition of man. Um, Prince Relian is under the control of the Green Witch, the witch is associated with green, thus potentially reminding readers of the Green Book embodying the modern education movement in the abolition of man. Indeed, the Green Witch attempts to indoctrinate Prince Relian, Jill, and Eustace through denying truths in similar ways that the Green Book attempts to. By imitating an educator and asking questions, the Green Witch tries to convince the children that there never was a son, a likely reference to Plato's standard of the good. The Green Witch also attempts to reduce human experience of the divine truth, such as the sublimity of a waterfall, as referenced in the abolition of man to materialist explanations. By doing so, the Green Witch is attempting to make them easier to subdue so that she can maintain her political control. In conclusion, the Chronicles of Narnia express Lewis's fear that education being used to create what he calls an abolition of man, men without chess, subject to those seeking political power. Thank you. Okay, next we will hear from Brianna Jones, representing Spanish. Her presentation is entitled, Interpreting Communally, How Service Learning Impacts Interpreting Proficiency. Brianna. If there is anything we are learning from ChatGPT right now, it is that while technology can provide certain benefits, it is no substitute for real-world experience. In order for students in Spanish medical interpreting classes to truly thrive in their interpreting proficiency, which includes language acquisition, cultural understanding, and uh, professionalization, they need some form of experiential learning. Currently, this is implemented at BYU through the use of Community Service Learning Project, in which students volunteer six hours of their time within the community. While largely beneficial, not all community partners offer the same learning opportunities. For example, the Malihe Clinic in Salt Lake City requires their volunteers to complete a training program in which they shadow another volunteer for a few weeks before they're able to interpret while the Community Rehabilitation Clinic in Provo has students start interpreting right away. Um, this thesis seeks to determine which partnership, if any, would provide the best symbiotic relationship between BYU and the community. Data was collected from students in the Fall 2022 course for Spanish 465, who took a background survey as well as a baseline interpreting test to determine their proficiency and any potential extraneous variables at the beginning of the semester. They then completed a community service project where they wrote a brief reflection paper about one encounter they had. At the end of the semester, their skills were tested once again in a final exam they completed as well as an experience survey about their community service. These exams were evaluated by three seasoned medical interpreters and the percentage increase for each student was found and compared. Preliminary exam data suggests there is a correlation between the percentage increase in proficiency between their baseline and final exams and the community partnering. This correlation suggests that one community partner might be a better opportunity for BYU students, resulting in greater opportunities for internships and structuring of the class itself. Preliminary survey data suggests that service learning be a greater focus in the course. 
While difficult to do in just one semester, this class could be developed into a greater portion of the Spanish translation and interpretation program here at BYU. The existing terminology classes could provide the backbone of the interpretation portion of the program, legal, business, medical, Spanish. Interpreting courses could be developed for each field based on the current course, and an experiential learning course could be developed where students would complete an internship or some form of community service in their desired field. By determining which, if any partnership, would be most beneficial to student learning, BYU can create an incubator for future interpreters. Okay, our next participant is Michelle Kehoe, representing Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. Her presentation is entitled, The Impact of Shadowing on Intermediate Level ESL Students. Shadowing. What is it and does it work? Shadowing is a pronunciation technique used by second language learners to improve their native-like accent. Shadowing is when an individual repeats speech as they hear it in live time. So, for example, if I was watching Despicable Me and wanted to shadow Gru to develop a more Gru-like accent, I might sound a little something like this. Hello, Fred. FYI, your dog has been leaving little bombs all over my yard, and I do not appreciate it. Now, my Gru accent isn't perfect. But I can guarantee that if I spent five to ten minutes over the next week practicing this line, that my Gru-like pronunciation would improve significantly. Shadowing research thus far has proven that shadowing not only helps with listening comprehension, but also pronunciation. So why continue studying, shadow studying shadowing if we already know that it works? Well, for two reasons. The first is that previous research up until this point has lacked a control group in their studies. And secondly, there's not much research showing whether or not shadowing impacts intermediate level English language learners. That's where my research comes in. Over the course of 14 weeks, um, treatment students participated in 10 weeks of shadowing, where they would spend 5 to 10 minutes a day shadowing a native um, English speaker. As you can tell, um, their post-test results showed that they improved statistically significantly in all four areas that we were measuring. Comprehensibility, fluency, accentedness, and their imitation abilities. This is really important work that we did. However, when we look at the control group, we noticed that they too also improved statistically significantly in their post-test results in all four areas. There is no statistical significant difference between the post-test results of the treatment group versus the control group. So shadowing, does it work? Well, I guess that depends on how you define work. Overall, student perceptions of shadowing were extremely positive, and thus I do believe it has merit in the L2 classroom. But did their native-like pronunciation improve in contrast to those who did not participate in shadowing? Not really. Thus, I urge all second language acquisition researchers to include a control group in their study so that as teachers and learners, we have empirical data to support how we choose to devote our pronunciation time and efforts. Thank you. Our next participant is Alexander Butterfield. Representing Comparative Studies, her presentation is entitled The Unburnt Offering, Mary as Co-Sacrifice in Early 16th Century Northern Birth of the Virgin Images. If I were to ask the people in this room to name for me Christ's maternal grandmother, I suspect that, maybe barring a frantic deep dive into family search, few of you would be able to do it. If you had lived in the early 16th century, however, this question would have been an absolute no-brainer. You would have known and venerated St. Anne. During this period of time, Catholics were interested in making Christ feel more accessible, and one of the ways that they did this was by providing him with an apocryphal extended family. Everybody loves a cute grandma, right? Well, it's that much better if that sweet little old lady can provide you with direct spiritual access to the Savior of the world. So the number of artworks and the amount of literature dedicated to St. Anne absolutely proliferated, and an interesting phenomenon came to pass. This is something that's been previously unexplored in academic literature, and it's the whole point of my thesis. 
The people began to see St. Anne as a kind of priestly figure because she was the ancestor to Christ, who was the ultimate high priest. And the more they saw Anne as priestly, the more they viewed the Virgin Mary as a kind of sacrifice. Catholics already believed that Mary played a helping, cooperative role in Christ's salvation of mankind. So Mary as co-sacrifice only expanded a previously existing notion. Now, let me direct your attention to Jan de Beer's Birth of the Virgin Mary. This was an important painting in the 16th century. It inspired many other similar Anne artworks, and it's a perfect embodiment of the priestly phenomenon. What you see here is approximately what it would have been like to give birth in the early 16th century if you were wealthy, so the scene is meant to be relatable. However, the artist has included a number of visual cues that inform us that a priestly sacrifice is taking place. That picture in the back of the image resembles a lavabo, the space where the priest would prepare for mass. The vessel held above the midwife's head looks like a pyx, the container for the Eucharist. And the midwife holding the Virgin Mary sits in front of a fireplace, which our historians have previously associated with an altar. This midwife presents Mary's fragile flesh to those sacrificial flames, and she raises her hand as if, in an allegorical sense, she is an Old Testament priest, wiping the blood of her sacrifice onto the altar, or even wiping the Passover lamb's blood onto the doorposts of her home. This painting, and others like it, therefore present the Virgin Mary as a kind of sacrifice, elevating her co-redemptive role. By using this familiar birthing environment and the beloved Saint Anne, this artist and others like him make the sacrifice of Christ that much more accessible to the original viewers. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Lauren Bazant, representing Second Language Teaching. Her presentation is entitled, Lingua Palooza, an Experiential Language Learning Contest. When I tell people that I teach French or that I'm studying Second Language Teaching, a common response I get is something along the lines of, oh, I took French for four years in high school and I remember nothing. Or, I served my mission in Thailand, but I came home and there was nobody to speak to, and so I just don't speak Thai anymore. And this is actually a really common profile of students at BYU, students that maybe learned a language once but are inactive now. And the other common profile will be those that are in a language classroom. They're enrolled, they're learning, but they're isolated from the, tar the real world in which they want to use their target language. One teacher even described her classroom as an island separated from the rest of the world. And so why is this problematic? Well, we certainly have students who are entering to learn languages at BYU, but they're not developing sufficient resources to be able to sustain that learning beyond the initial learning context and past their studies here in order to go forth and serve using their language. And so I, together with the language research team, developed the Lingua Palooza. It's an experiential language learning contest. By experiential, we mean that students are actually using their language in the real world with real people. It's not a simulation in a classroom. And we used evidence-based teaching practices to prepare a full program, not just a list of projects, but tasks and exercises to prepare them for that real world experience, as well as an opportunity to reflect on how they've done so that they can make improvements next time and long-term goals. And in order to make this contest appealing to students, we created prizes. Obviously, that's going to attract more attention. So for every week that students complete a project, they'll receive a prize that increases in value over time to promote longevity in the program. And at the end of the four weeks, if students have completed all four projects, we'll, we'll review their reflections and choose one student who exemplifies being a dedicated lifelong language learner to receive a $500 cash prize. And together, these incentives with the program that we developed Students are able to create that foundation that they need to be able to have lifelong language learning without the support of a classroom or a teacher. And the great thing is, we know that it's already working. We had a pilot program last semester, and we have students that are, to this day, continuing on with projects that they started in our program. They meet once a week with a native speaker of their target language who's learning English, and they speak together in the two languages for a few hours. And students have expressed that this has helped them with gaining better cultural awareness and understanding of their target culture. It's helped them become more humble in their language learning. And it's also given them better perspectives of how to reach out to native speakers of their language in the community. And initial data from this semester's contest is showing really similar results. 
And we know that we hope that if we continue to develop this contest, we'll be able to create this culture of lifelong language learning at BYU. Our final participant is Devin Hunsaker, representing linguistics. His presentation is entitled The Effect of Musical Training on Second Language Grammar Acquisition. Have you ever heard that music makes you smarter? There is plenty of research that suggests that musical training can help us in other areas, such as math, general reasoning, and language. And a lot of the research that has been done on music and language has focused on how music helps us with the sounds of language. So in things like tonal processing and phonological acquisition. But not a lot of work has been done on the relationship between music and grammar and grammar acquisition. And this is interesting because both musical syntax and linguistic syntax share several similarities. For example, both are systems of hierarchical structure. They both share the function of communicating ideas and emotion. And they also share similar processing pathways in the brain. So in my study, we recruited beginning level Spanish students and gave them a music aptitude test, after which we briefly taught them a new grammatical concept that they had not yet learned in class. And immediately after teaching them this concept, they completed a grammaticality judgment task while being hooked up to EEG brain scanning technology. And as you can see, what we found in this study was that there's a certain brain response that's associated with an unfamiliar word form. And that brain response was not correlated with the music aptitude test scores, meaning that the participants that did better on the music aptitude test didn't necessarily do better on the grammar test, or that their brain wasn't processing the new grammatical concepts any easier or any differently. So what does this mean for our question then? Well, I don't necessarily think it disproves a possible relationship between music and grammar processing, but it does mean that general music aptitude, as we've measured it, is not correlated with second language grammar success. So in future studies, by narrowing, by narrowing our music uh, population, so for example, by focusing on a group of jazz improvisers whose musical activity more closely reflects what we do in language, not only in how we use it, but also in how we learn it, we could see different results, and that would be incredibly interesting to see and carry out that study. And why is this question even important? Well, first of all, I think by understanding what makes people better language learners, it can make us better language teachers. In addition, music education programs across the country and public school systems have been getting cut in funding, and I think by using science to show how music can help us in other academic areas, it can be just one more reason to keep these programs funded and alive. So that is my research, and I thank you for your time and attention. Let's give another round of applause for everybody who participated. We're going to excuse the judges for a few, to take a few minutes to tally and finalize the scores. So, and we've got a soundproof booth in the back for you, or something out there, for you. or maybe you just have to sit in the hall, I'm not sure. But, um, while we're waiting for them, I wanted to share with you my own story of how I learned to appreciate the 3MT concept um, and consciousness. When I was working on my dissertation, uh, my wife and I had been married a couple of years, and we would be at social functions, and somebody in the a friend or someone would ask me, so, what is it you're doing? I'm working on a PhD. Oh, what are you writing about? I said, well, here's my dissertation. And about 10 minutes later, my wife would start pulling my coat and, and, and indicating to me that I was going on a bit long. And so uh, after that happened once or twice, she said, you know, you need to come up with a five-minute version and a two-minute version of your dissertation research that you can tell anybody anywhere. And it was brilliant, because I, the five-minute version, if I, they looked really interested, then I would give them the five-minute version. And if they were being polite, they would get a two-minute disquisition, and we could continue into the normal conversational realm. So I've come personally to understand, I'm, I can bear my testimony of the three-minute <laughs> thesis uh, value in your life. So for those of you who participated, you've done a great thing here. You've got a nice tool, a nice way to explain it to other people. Well, can I invite the uh, participants to come up on the stage?
Okay, I'll give you a chance to learn something about them. I have a little bio here that I will read, but first I want to ask a question and have you each answer this. What have you most enjoyed about your graduate studies at BYU? Let's start. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I guess I'm tired. Um, Hands down, it's been teaching writing 150. I love engaging with students with ideas and helping them think critically and express what they're thinking about. Okay, cool. My favorite thing about graduate studies is the light bulb moment that goes off in a, in a student's mind when they finally understand the concept. Whether it's my own learning or the students that I get to learn how to teach better. Seeing that light bulb goes off makes all the rest of the pains just be with it and fade away. I really loved being able to go to a super nerdy conference last semester and then having professors that support me in taking what I learned from my nerdy conference and applying it in the classroom. I just love the research. Like that feels a little selfish when you guys are talking about students, but I love the research. I love being able to talk about it with the fellow students and the kind of community that we share. I think it's fantastic. Uh, my program gave me the qualifications needed in order to land an internship in the Czech Republic, and it was really, really cool being able to teach um, English out there in the countryside. That was a very transformative experience for me. So super happy about that. I would say. Being able to think of my own research question and then find out the answer using really extensive brain scanning technology. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, let me let me read a little bit about each one of them. Meg Johnson writes literary allegories for students or er, for children, young adult social satire. Uh, Brianna Jones is determ a determined woman who enjoys spending her time with loved ones and is often caught brainstorming her next project on a piece of scratch paper. Her love of Spanish translation began on her mission when she spent her time serving many Spanish speakers who were faced with situations where they desperately needed an interpreter. She now strives to learn how best to teach future interpreters to better serve the Spanish-speaking community. Uh, Michelle Kehoe is studying teaching English to speakers of other languages. In her free time, she enjoys being outdoors, climbing, and spending time with her friends. Alexander Butterfield will be graduating with her master's degree in April, after which she plans to pursue a PhD in art history. Her research interests involve around 16th century Netherlandish altar pieces, particularly images of women, pregnancy, and childbirth. Lauren Bazant grew up in Colorado and has lived in Utah since starting her undergrad at BYU in 2012. She loves everything related to language learning and teaching, including traveling, interacting with people from other cultures, especially her husband, who is from Chile, and raising her kids in French and Spanish. And Devin is from Colorado and is in the last semester of his master's. He loves playing the trumpet and singing musical theater. Now let me ask you each a question. How many of you were undergraduate majors in the College of Humanities? Is that 100%? Looks like it. And how many of you are in the program that you majored in as undergraduates? Okay. So there's life after undergraduate. <laughs> Going into something else. Well, we felt we felt comfortable here in our undergrad. <laughs> so that is to say. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. Questions from the audience for any of our participants. All right. Well, then let's uh, you, let's see. We're gonna we're gonna be. Do you want to sit down again? Yeah. Why don't you sit down, take a breather, and then when they get back, we'll call you back up for the award. I'm going to announce the, the winners. The prizes, and I will announce them in reverse order. So the third place, the, the third place winner who will be receiving five hundred dollars is Lauren Bazan. The second place winner who will be receiving seven hundred fifty dollars is Michelle Kehoe. And the first place winner who will receive a thousand dollars is Alexander Butterfield. And if you want to learn more about the competition, the uh, university-wide one will be happening on, we think, Thursday the 16th of March. We're guessing that. It's Thursday the 15th. Thursday is at 11 o'clock, so it's during that magical hour on Thursday the 16th, uh, where our first place winner will be representing the college in that competition. Go and support her, and uh, if you're interested, 
And those of you who are here aren't in graduate studies, this alone is reason enough to go into graduate school. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attendance.